Hey, Canyon Creek, I can't be with you here today, but I'm excited for you to hear Jeremy Olson continue our Jesus Said What series. Welcome to Canyon Creek Church. I want to welcome you in the middle of our Jesus Said What series. We're taking a look at some of the things that Jesus actually said. Uh, Statements you might be shocked that he said. Statements that maybe you and I never fully grasped what it meant for us today. Uh, For those of you that don't know me, let me introduce myself. My name's Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here at Canyon Creek, uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you this weekend. Uh, As we get started, I got a simple question for you. How many of you have ever been in an argument with a sibling? Okay, there's a few of you. You know what I call you? I call you people uh, that have siblings. That's how that works. See, I used to be in arguments with my siblings all the time. I have a brother and a sister, and I know what it's like to argue. In fact, you might even say uh, that I was a professional at arguing. I was really good at it. Uh, I was the youngest child, a uh, little bit of an instigator in my family. According to my parents, I thought I was perfect, uh, but uh, my parents told me otherwise. I learned a lot from watching my older siblings, and I knew that if they could argue like that, I could argue better than them. Um, maybe, maybe you've never had an argument with a sibling. We'll call you an only child. Um, I'm However, I'll bet that you've mediated an argument between siblings. See, I'm a parent, so I do that just about every day. Arguments that are so simple that start with things like, he took my toy. Okay, my kid's five and seven years old right now, so the arguments happen a lot. Specifically on Saturday when mom and dad don't have anything better to do than mediate, uh, or when we're in the car when they don't have anything better to do other than sit in silence and listen to the children argue. My personal favorite happened this weekend. It started this way, silence from the back seat. And then suddenly, she keeps looking at me. It's good to have children. We love children. They're great. But they give us an idea of how to resolve conflict. And when I was growing up, conflict was resolved very simply by yelling, throwing things, and yelling some more and then running and hiding. Now, the thing here is, this all happened while my parents weren't watching. I had good parents. It makes you, if you don't think that my parents were around, you're you're missing the point here. When my parents were looking at us, we had a different way of solving our problems. Uh, And it mostly came around my parents solving the problems for us, um, sometimes in the way of the look. Now, if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. There's a look that parents can use to solve kids' problems. It goes a little something like this. And immediately your kids will understand, if you've got this down, your kids will understand it's time to stop our conflict. If you haven't gotten that look down yet, just practice in the mirror. Uh, If you need a reference point, try a YouTube video with Kevin Hart. His facial expressions are great. But enough of that. Let's see what Jesus said about resolving conflict. We're going to be reading today from Matthew chapter 18. Uh, And if you don't have your Bibles, we'll show the words for you as well. Uh, Jesus took the time to talk about conflict resolution. And there's a lot of places, including our church, that use the concepts taught in this section of Scripture to deal with conflict, Um, even conflict in the workplace. And I know some of you right now are sitting there scratching your head saying, we don't have conflict in the workplace. This is a church. Everybody's Christian. They all love each other and get along. Right. Come see us during the week. Um, No, I'm just kidding. Right now, our office is actually a really, really awesome, healthy place, and we love it. But that's not to say that we're all perfect. Sometimes there are still issues, so we need to have an outlined way of dealing with those problems. And here in Matthew chapter 18 is a good layout for how we're going to deal with that. So let's start reading in verse 15. It says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. 
If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Would you stop for a moment, just pray with me today. Jesus, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, challenge us, and change us so we may become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so before we dive into the text here, I've got a couple words of caution that I want to share with you. First off, very simply, this passage of Scripture does not give us license to run around and judge everyone in the church. All right, I know some of you are thinking, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Go after him and say, hey, you messed up. That's not the way this is supposed to be. This is also not the best practice for people that don't have a relationship with Jesus. You know, you go up to somebody, you introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Jeremy. You've got sin in your life and you need to repent or you're going to go and spend eternity with separation from God. That's not the best idea. It's not effective. It's a bad plan. This is intended, this method of conflict resolution, intended for people who already have a place inside the church family. Because this method is where we speak from a relationship. Relationships give you permission to speak into someone's life. I want to warn you, don't try to speak from somebody else's relationship. Hey, Pastor Brandon told me to tell you. That's not going to work either. Another caution that I have for you is... A lot of people come after this and say, conflict, conflict, conflict. I love dealing with conflict. It's fantastic. It's great. And it gives me an opportunity to be tough. Here's the problem. If we look at the context of this chapter, the entire chapter is about dealing with and caring for other people. The previous story that Jesus shares is about leaving the 99 to find the one. He's talking about the shepherd that has 99 sheep in a field that are being awesome. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do. I don't know what sheep are supposed to do, but they're doing it. They're all in the same place. They're hanging out together. They're safe, protected. And there's one that has gone missing. The one may be hurt, definitely lost, may be hungry. He may be in a lot of trouble. And Jesus is describing that the good shepherd is going to go find this lost sheep because he cares for it, because he wants to bring it back. Before that, he talked about the consequences of leading someone else into sin. Jesus said that it's better to have a stone tied around your neck and have you thrown into the sea than you would lead one of my children into sin. See, so here we're looking at this and we're approaching conflict not for the sake of I get to jump into conflict. We're approaching conflict from the sake of I need to care for people. This is the standpoint that Jesus had. I have to care about them. That's why I'm trying to solve these issues. And the perspective matters really simply because if we approach conflict from the wrong direction, we may apply the wrong solution. And even if you get to the right answer, you can cause unnecessary pain along the way. Jesus isn't about conflict resolution for the sake of hurting people. He's doing this for the sake of restoring people. So as we de- dig into this, I want to understand this is coming from the say I need to care about people. So if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. First thing that we're going to do with conflict is we're going to speak up. If your brother sins against you, speak up. Very simply, we cannot solve a problem that we're not aware of. Make sure we're aware there's a problem. Oftentimes, sin can be living in a person's blind spot. Now, we know what the blind spot is when we're driving the car. It's that place between your shoulder and where the mirror shows you. There can be something hiding in there that you don't see. Here's what it is when you're talking about somebody's life. 
It's where a sin or a problem or an issue is obvious to everyone except you. That's your blind spot. So go privately. Because we want to make sure, again, we're talking about taking care of people. The goal is not to cause personal injury or embarrassment. The goal is to bring people to restoration to solve a problem. I learned this a long time ago when I was working at UPS. They taught me a management skill. It was praise in public, criticize in private. And really what we're looking at here is anything that's good, if you're rewarding somebody, you're recognizing somebody, you're honoring somebody for anything that they have done, you're like, I want them to repeat this behavior. This is awesome. Do that publicly. It's a good thing to do. You reward behavior that shows up that you want to see repeated. Do that publicly. People are more likely to repeat it, and they feel good. They know that you're watching. They know that you care about them, and they know you're happy with them. That's a great thing. But when you need to provide correction, you need to provide a critique or even a criticism. I know criticism is a harsh word, but from time to time, that needs to happen. If you need to correct somebody, you should be doing it privately because it's going to be more effective. We don't want to bring somebody out into public and say, hey, did everybody, did you see what they did? That's not how correction is supposed to happen. Go privately at first to preserve the relationship. This is not a time to vent. This is a time to create peace. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And we don't create peace. We don't even maintain peace when we talk about somebody else's issues publicly. Airing dirty laundry is never going to be a good thing to resolve a conflict. It's always going to make things worse. So number one, speak up. The second thing that we're challenged to do is to stand up. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Don't let this conflict, don't let this issue hide. Enlist the help of godly counsel and seek peace. If you can't get through this on your own, it doesn't mean you should give up. It means that you need to get help and try again. Why? Because people are important. People matter enough that we need to reach out and try to take care of them. Again, remember, this is dealing with conflict, dealing with issues inside our church. That means they're part of our family. They are important. People are worth going after. This section says you need a number of witnesses. Take two or three along with you so that the truth may be established by a number of witnesses. Two was the minimum number of witnesses that was acceptable in this time. This copies the requirement that God gave for the number of witnesses required in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, God was outlining the punishing of those accused of abomination before the Lord. Now, abomination, more than just a comic book character, although that's all my son will recognize. Abomination is something that is going to cause hatred or disgust. So somebody who brings an issue before the Lord that causes hatred or disgust, there's punishment. And punishment in Deuteronomy was pretty severe. The punishment was they were to be executed by stoning. We're going to throw rocks at them until they are dead. Fortunately, the standard in the New Testament is quite different from that, and we're not throwing rocks at anybody. However, the church held the same standard for testimony through Jesus' time. We need to have a minimum of two people in order to establish the truth. It's important that we don't miss this because we don't ever want to escalate to the next steps if we're being mistaken. It's important to make sure we're being truthful, we're being honest, and we're approaching an actual issue rather than something that is a perceived issue. First, we need to speak up. Second, we need to stand up. And the third thing, if he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. This is our opportunity to step back. This is where we look at it and we say, okay, if you're not going to listen to me, if you're not going to listen to us, let's go talk to the church. 
Now, I'm going to give you a little clarity here. In this time, the local church is often going to function as a local court. They are meant to evaluate internal disputes. Okay, Again, family matters. We're taking this stuff to ourselves. This does not refer to gossip. This doesn't mean we get the privilege to go on social media and share with everybody what happened. Did you hear what they did? Don't blast them on social media and claim that you're asking for prayer. It's not the same thing. We call that gossip. That's not what we're supposed to do. If he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. We're basically looking to our leadership inside the church, either a pastor or an elder or a deacon, somebody that's got wisdom and knowledge from God that's going to help us resolve the issues. And if he doesn't listen to them, the Bible says, treat him as a Gentile or a tax collector. Other translations say a pagan or a tax collector. Now, I need you to understand what this means in this context. We all have this idea how Jews treated tax collectors. We, uh, we don't like them. Why? Because they're taking our money. That's like our view of the IRS today. I don't like them because they're taking my hard-earned money. It goes a little deeper than that. For Jews, the tax collectors and the pagans were considered unclean, and thus they should be avoided. Now, this doesn't give us permission to hate someone. It doesn't give us permission to judge them or even to just simply withhold our forgiveness from them. We've got to still forgive people in order to avoid bitterness in our own lives. Now, that's a whole nother message all by itself. We're not going to go there today, but it's important that we don't miss that. We still need to forgive even if they choose not to repent. What it means is if you can't resolve the conflict between the two of you, a close relationship is not a good choice. It's not time to hate because, again, the goal here ultimately is restoration of a person. But ongoing, unrepented sin cannot be allowed in the church. Jesus is trying to say unrepentant sinners need to be removed from the church. Right here, you have a fine balance between discipline and grace. Because there's a lot of chances to get this right. There are many opportunities for somebody to receive grace, repent, and be restored. Now, I got to tell you, by the time we get here, we're obviously not dealing with something as simple as, did you hear what she said about what she was wearing? It's not that kind of conflict. Here now, by the time you escalate to go tell it to the church, you're dealing with obvious sin in somebody's life. This is more serious than a simple squabble. And so now we need to find a balance between discipline and grace. Grace can't be used as a license to continue sinning. In fact, Paul describes this in Romans 6. He asks the question, shall I go on sinning so that grace may increase? And the answer is no. At some point, there's got to be an end to our poor behavior that leads to unrepentant sin. There's got to be a deciding moment that says, this is a problem. I recognize it. I need to stop my behavior. I need to repent and be restored. The biggest sin that Jesus was referring to early in the chapter was leading someone else into sin. See, when we're talking about being a church, it's our job, it's our obligation that we lead other people to Jesus. And if we are in fact being a stumbling block for that and causing other people to get closer to sin instead of closer to Jesus, We've got to change. We can't be that way in the church. Our job is to get close to Jesus. And so, so this is where it gets interesting. This is where the challenge comes in that you and I have to deal with because we have to deal with an unrepentant Christian, which already by itself sounds very complicated. How can you be unrepentant and still be a Christian? No repentance means no restoration. And that means... They don't belong. Jesus was giving the church authority to remove unrepentant people from their fellowship. 
He's saying, I have a standard for you. And I want to make sure that you have the authority to take care of the unity inside your church. By removing an unrepentant person from the community, the church is confirming the person's choice, removing the branches that are already dead on the vine. What are you talking about? John chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus said, I am the vine, and my Father, God, is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. See, Jesus is saying right there, I'm the vine. We've heard this before. I'm the vine, other translations include, and you are the branches, okay? You and I are supposed to be connected to Jesus. We're supposed to be in close fellowship with him because he is the one that supplies us with our life. He's the one that supplies us with the things that we need in order to survive and to bear fruit, Now, the fruit that we are supposed to bear in this case, again, bringing other people closer to Jesus, representing Jesus well. That's our purpose. That's our mission, what we're supposed to do. And Jesus told us, if you're not bearing fruit, you're going to be removed. In other words, if this vine does not bear fruit in keeping with who Jesus is, the vine doesn't fit. The vine needs to be removed. The vine essentially is not taking life from Jesus. The vine is dead. By removing an unrepentant person from the church, the church confirms their choice not to be like Jesus. Now, I got to give you another word of caution because this is the point here where we could look at this and say, I'm done with you. I've got nothing else for you. I don't want to ever see you again. And that also was not what Jesus was going for. It says, treat them as a pagan or a tax collector, not as a demonic spirit. So in other words, treat them as someone who has the opportunity to repent and be restored. Remember, the goal in the first place was repentance. The goal was restoration. The goal was approach this as someone you're caring about. So we never want to just say, I I give up. There's no hope for you. It's, I'm going to put you back where Jesus can work on you because it's too much for me. I don't have the ability to change your heart. But don't give up on your brother or your sister because Jesus still loves them and you and I should too. It goes on and it says, where two or three are gathered... There I am with them. The context here suggests that this is not just a simple prayer meeting. This is not just an opportunity where me and my two friends, we got together and we started praying for things and seeing what happened. The context suggests that these are the two or three that are gathered for the sake of restoration of the individual. Deuteronomy chapter 17, the witnesses were the first ones to cast the stones at the execution. However, in this case, the two or three are being the first to call to pray. This is our our important thing. If we must resort to discipline, if grace and forgiveness hasn't worked, if we've got to resort to discipline, it should be done with agreement of other people. You and I should never, ever be doing this by ourselves. Even in the case of removing someone in the church, The removal was normally reversible if repentance took place. This is a decision that you don't want to make by yourself because we want to make sure that we do it for an actual reason and not just because we're upset. You can't take this so seriously that you look at someone and say, I'm more spiritual than you. I know what's best for you and I'm simply going to remove you, that's not your job. You and I don't have the right to do that. And the other thing is, removal is not permanent because of the work of Jesus Christ. You and I are called to continually pray for restoration because that's what God is all about. That's what he wants. Pray for restoration because that's the goal. 
Jesus cares for the 99 and yet he leaves and he searches for the one because he wants to bring us back. Again, I tell you truly that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. We are now building on the power of unity. We have gone through and we've gathered for the sake of removing sin and restoring people. And now God says, call on my name and I will be with you. If we can agree on this, we can ask Jesus for his will and he will answer. Miracles can be released when we have this kind of unity. When we have this unity that's created by repentance, it's powerful. God will bless the people that have unity through repentance. And so today we pray, God, help us protect the unity in your church. Help us protect each other by creating opportunities for grace and repentance. And help us represent you well by doing things your way and not ours. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would give us opportunities to forgive. That you would give us the ability to choose grace. That you would give us the ability to choose restoration. And God, to give us courage that we may help others along that way. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching our message online this week. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please check out our website, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We'll see you next week.